my, I, I, I always hang on to this thought of when I when I did the uh, the Viva examination with examiners um, for my doctorate. You know, you go and you you present your written thesis, and they come back and they ask you questions and interview you and basically grill you. They wrote up a report in which they said I was afflicted with airy frivolity. <laughs> and I've always been very proud of that. Indeed, yeah. Anyway. It's a nice place. <laughs> Indeed. My guest today is the anthropologist and writer, Nigel Barley. Now, one of the things that I overachieve in this episode is to hide just how much of a massive, massive fan I am of Nigel's writing and how much of an influence it had on me when I read his, um, particularly his book, The Innocent Anthropologist, but quite a lot of his other books as well when I was younger. Um, so yeah, I probably play a bit too cool and don't get across to him just how amazing I think he is. In conversation, he turns out to be every bit as brilliant as he is when he's writing his books. The thing that strikes me when I listen back to this is how somebody who is so interesting, clearly so intelligent, has led such a fascinating life, can come across as so down to earth and humble. And that is what makes, maybe what makes his books so special and you definitely need to check those out but also what hopefully makes this episode special as well. So, without further ado, let's hear from the legendary Nigel Barley, and let's hear about his wonders of the world. So you made your name in ethnography, which for the uninitiated is basically, you can correct me if I'm wrong about this, it's basically going to live with a group of people, spending time with them to sort of study them and understand them. And in one of your own books, you said that the best explanation for the motivation for ethnographic fieldwork is that it is simply the triumph of sheer nosiness over reasonable caution. So given that uh, slightly sceptical view, I wondered whether you can trace back where that um, nosiness comes from. Is that something that you picked up in childhood? Do you think that was something you were born with or something that came later in life? Everything. In life. The more you look back uh, in life, the more you realise that absolutely everything is autobiographical. Um, and even when you're writing about other people, you're really writing about yourself. Um, and one of the boons of anthropology is really not just, you know, trying to understand people who are so, so very different. It, it gives you an insight into uh, your own motivations, your own ideas, your own prejudices, where you came from. I was born in, in, in Weybridge, which is a very respectable place. Um, but I was the wrong side of the tracks. All my friends were very much richer, um, much more middle class, much more respectable than I was. And I, I, I always had this feeling throughout life at school, university and so forth, of being in some sense an outsider. Right. And it's that sense, I think, of alienation of, uh, you know, looking at a script for life which isn't your own that is very often what leads people into anthropology in the first place. Um, and coupled with that, uh, I've always had this sort of weird fixation. I've never really understood why anthropologists go off to exotic islands and uh, jungles and swamps and deserts to work on people they know absolutely nothing about, whose language they don't speak, instead of working on their own people at home and trying to understand them. So I was sort of weird as an anthropologist in that I had one foot in and one foot out of the culture that really interested me. Uh, and I found that the best way actually to approach that culture uh, was rather through novels than straight anthropology. And that's that's why your work has sort of moved, I guess, from anthropological works to your fictional work. Do you, that's true. Mm. Do you now, in your later years in life, do you feel not more comfortable, I suppose? If Would you rather go somewhere familiar? You know, you would you rather walk into the sort of the bar in Cheers, as it were, <laughs> or would you rather go somewhere new and 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 uh, you know be an outsider? Wh wh which of those two experiences appeals to you more? Well, I, I must confess, uh, as I've got older, my uh, interest in new things has has declined. Anthropology is a young person's sport. Mm -hmm. First of all, you have to know that you're immortal, 
which young people do and old people don't. I mean, old people see death around every corner <laughs> in the supermarket. Um, you have to go off to these places, which are increasingly dangerous, it has to be said, um, and uh, throw away all your support systems, um, cope with people whose language you don't speak, whose basic ideas you don't necessarily share. Um, and also it helps to be young and endearing because one of the strongest uh, support systems you're going to have in anthropology is older women who are going to mother you and save you from the depredations of young men. That's a sound piece of advice. <laughs> play, play the clueless young man card. Is that what, basically what you're saying to any aspiring puppy anthropologist? Eyes. Puppy eyes will get you a long way in anthropology. <laughs> That's superb. Okay, you've also segued us nicely into your first um, wonder of the world today, which is your possession, because we're going to go back in time to to that younger version of yourself um, and the the journey and, and the book that made your name for yourself really, which was The Innocent Anthropologist. And you're gonna tell us about a possession that you picked up whilst you were in Africa, I believe. Yeah, well, my first uh, possession, uh, working at a museum, of course, you get uh, fixed on the idea of the way people use objects to think socially, personally, uh, biographically. And this is a very important one for me in all sorts of ways. It's a very simple African water jar. It couldn't be simpler, just a sphere of clay made out of coils of, of clay smoothed out with a neck. Um, it's unglazed, it's baked in a bonfire, and you use it for storing water in. But it's very important for me because um, academically it was a great turning point because in the amongst the people I was working with, the Dwayos of North Cameroon, there were about, I suppose, 40,000 of them, they lived up a mountain. Um, potters were very important. Potters were always women. Potters were married to male blacksmiths, and they had a sort of, they were a sort of unclean caste. You couldn't marry them, they couldn't draw their water from the same place as you. Uh, and of course, they became instantly fascinating. And it was really through working with potters that I realized that pots are ways of thinking about women and their bodies in Africa. Women are, if you like, seen as leaky vessels. Pots, water pots have the same marks carved into them as women have on their bellies. Women are sort of uh, regarded as storage spaces for children. Uh, I know this all sounds very biological and uh, anti-feminist and so forth, but I'm just reporting what people told me. Um, and uh, at a, the, um, the, the, the potter is also the midwife. If women have a hard time giving birth, they're sat in the place where pots are baked. The midwife's tools are the potter's tools and on death uh, a woman's head is pulled off and her water jar is smashed. So they're very, very important ways of thinking about who women are, what their powers are, and of course in Africa that, that's very much centred on childbirth. So for me uh, it was a complete eye-opener. Um, I mean I worked with potters, I was a man, so that was all completely wrong. I wasn't right. supposed to make pots. Did, it, did, they get did. Annoyed? did people get annoyed that you were sort of interested in the things no, that they no, thought no, weren't no, important? I, there's a great deal of nonsense taught in anthropology courses about how to fit in. You don't have to fit in. You have to go and you have to be weird and people will laugh at you. <laughs> Humour is one of the great neglected tools of anthropology. Being prepared to be a bit of an idiot, uh, giving people a laugh. It's one of the ways in which you can pay people back for all their kindnesses. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, African villages are actually very boring places. Uh, and a weird white man going around doing weird stuff and making people laugh is, is a welcome diversion. Indeed. So, I, I mean, I made my uh, my first pot. It was very solemnly taken away and fired. Um, when I went back uh, and tried to collect it, they said, oh, no, they said uh, some dealer came around from America and bought it for a museum. So there we are. I'm now somewhere in a museum in America Brilliant. as a genuine Dwyo pot. <laughs> Someone's said they're sort of pompously admiring the craft of your your well, naive one day I'm sure I'll, in, I'll encounter it. <laughs> so, um, I, and, and so the book in, in as an anthropologist, as well as being very interesting, is extremely funny. Um, I, I, if I've got this right, I'm guessing that you went out to do the field work and sort of found humour by, by your description as a sort of necessary way of you know getting to know people and you know getting along with them. And then when you came back, you then had the decision to make about writing the book and um, the way that you decided to write the book up as a sort of comical um, account would have 
from my understanding, would have been or was very frowned upon at the time by the anthropological community. Did it feel like a big decision at the time to write it that way? Or did it feel like, um, was it just something you had to do, to be honest? What, 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 what was the part of that process in terms of that? Well, well, now, now you're doing what people do when they look backwards, they make all the lines straight. Right. It wasn't like that. It was a whole process of dithering and futzing about. But I, I came back and I wrote what was sort of a standard anthropological, anthropological you see, even I can't say it, monograph. <laughs> um, and it had lots of diagrams and formulae and abstract nouns in it. And it took me uh, 18 months to write. And it just didn't feel right. Um, I thought this is, it, 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 it just wasn't like that. Um, so I rewrote it and it got shorter and it still was. I rewrote it, it got short. I thought I better stop before it disappears entirely. And it was that, at that moment um, that I realized what was wrong with There were no human beings in it. Um, so I sat down and I wrote as it really was, full of sights and sounds and feelings and sensations. It wasn't objective, it was e extremely subjective. Um, and it took me about six weeks to write that, as opposed to the 18 months of the, the previous one. Right. Um, I took it to my tutor who read it and said, I liked that. He said, don't ever publish it, you'll never work again in academic life. Uh, I sent it to virtually every publisher in the UK. They all wrote back saying things like, well, that made us laugh. And anthropology doesn't often make us laugh. Um, you'll understand, of course, we couldn't possibly publish it. Um, so it, it sat on my wardrobe for several years. And really, I only ever saw the light of day because I joined the British Museum. And as the new boy, I was invited to lunch. Uh, and the museum ran its own publishing house. Um, which in those days, not now, in those days, was very chaotic. Um, I mean, for example, uh, museums thrive on desk diaries. Now, you know exactly what you need in a desk diary. You need 12 very nice pictures. You need the calendar. And you know it has to be out in, what, mid-December, so people buy it for Christmas. Well, they always used to get theirs out in sort of late January. <laughs> uh, so it was that sort of an organisation. Yeah. I happened, uh, again, totally random. You see, one shouldn't think in straight lines. Um, the reason it got published was that I preferred cheese to uh, some creamy dessert. And I went over to, I was invited to lunch as a new boy. The head of the publishing house was there. We both went for the same piece of cheese and we got talking and he said, well, I'm a bit short of titles this year. I don't suppose you've got any. Yes, I said, well, I, 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 I've got a book, but I, I don't suppose you'd be interested. Oh, he said, send it across, we'll take a look. And so it got published. And the, the second thing I'm proud of with that book is that there's a, an august organisation called the Association of Social Anthropologists of Great Britain and the British Commonwealth. And um, they, I, I was a member of it, sort of by default, for, by being a professional anthropologist. Um, and they discussed uh, seriously the proposition that I should be flung out for having brought the entire profession of anthropology into disrepute. It wasn't passed, but um, I'm very proud of the <laughs> accusation. It was a close call. That that and yet every frivolity. I mean, I, I, as as you know, I'm a massive massive fan of the books. So I'm very I'm very pleased that it did find a home in terms of the publishing. And uh, certainly, anybody out there I would recommend is a great great starting point in terms of. Uh, getting to know your work. So from um, perhaps your most uh, famous journey that you made to I think what would be your most treasured journey that you made and we're moving on to your second uh, one of the world which is your your place and I think you're going to tell us about Indonesia and uh, how and why you fell in love with with that part of the world. Yes indeed uh, Africa uh, was for me very very interesting absolutely fascinating place um, but I didn't love it um, I mean, I nearly died several times, and uh, a bit of a I, I learned an awful lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Indonesia, I, I just fell in love with. And I, it, the moment, I think, uh, I would fix as uh, uh, having occurred in, in Jakarta Airport. Now, I'm sure not many people fall in love with the UK at Heathrow. Uh, Jakarta Airport, this isn't the new snazzy Jakarta Airport, which is all fancy architecture, this is the old one. And it had in common with Heathrow that was constantly being rebuilt without somehow ever getting any better. 
Uh, and I arrived after this long flight, 15 hours or so. Uh, and there was this weird system whereby you arrived in the international uh, terminal and you wanted to get to the domestic terminal to fly off to another island, but you couldn't go from one to the other, though they were right next door to each other in the same building. You had to go into a queue, get in a taxi, drive all around the perimeter of the airport at huge cost, and come in through another door in the same building, and there you were in the domestic terminal. And this seemed to me outrageous. So I sat down to sort of gather my strength before I got in the queue. And an Indonesian queue is not a British queue, I would point out. It's quite an active thing involving pushing <laughs> and shoving and elbows. And I, there was a policeman sitting next to me, and I favoured him with my views on this subject. And he said, oh, he said, look, he said, don't, don't, don't upset yourself. Look, you see that door over there marked uh, authorised entry only. Right, well, go through there. And you go to the end of the corridor and you see another door marked danger of death. Go through there, it will turn right, not left. Uh, and at the end of that corridor, you'll come to another door, which is marked emergency use only. This door is alarmed, but it isn't. Just go through there and you're in the domestic terminal. So I followed these instructions and it worked perfectly. And I thought, what a wonderful place where a, a policeman would so totally dis disregard every regulation in the book. And it sort of will prove to be the key in Indonesia that the personal always overrides the institutional. Right. Um, and I, I mean, I, I just loved the idea of the place. It was organized chaos and incredibly friendly. And everyone was sort of have a back path or a back door or a way in and they'd help you. And it was an absolutely lovely experience from beginning to end. It sounds so. So you've been there a few times professionally to write to write books. Have you spent a lot of um, other parts of your life there or ever thought about moving there on a permanent basis? I'm constantly tempted uh, by uh, by moving there, but um, I actually enjoy the alternation. Right. I, 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 I love the sense of being a foreigner uh, in Indonesia, and it, mm -hmm. it's, it, it, it's a good place to be a foreigner. And then I like the sense of, you know, relaxing and being at home at home. So, yeah, I mean, I have constantly been tempted by it. And I, well, and up until recently, and... Uh, the impossibility of going anywhere. I used to go at least once a year. Right. And I actually I, I actually sort of find myself feeling ill if I don't go once a year. Really? So I've had to uh I've had to find other substitutes. I mean, my partner is uh, a Malay Singaporean uh who is part of a a Balinese dance troupe in London. So I'm sort of right. a groupie of the Balinese <laughs> dance troupe in, in England. Superb. Uh, so, I mean, um, there's about, I think this is my uh, Wikipedia research, there's about 17,000 islands in Indonesia. So when you go there, do you are you going to explore different parts or are they just familiar bits that you return to now? Uh, I used to. I mean, I had this uh, weird um, ambition to visit every part. I mean, you say 70,000, sometimes it's 22,000. Right, and okay. when you ask the population, sometimes it's 220 million. Uh, <laughs> then they say, no, 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 that was last week. It's 240 million now. Right. Uh, so I, I, as uh, that great philosopher Clint Eastwood teaches us, a man must know his limitations. <laughs> so I do try to go to one or two new places every now and then. But uh, basically, I, I tend to go back to the places I know, where I know people, and I've got friends and I've got contacts. Um, and uh, yes, I'm once again. I'm I'm going back to uh, the familiar. And and is it the is it the people? Is it you know that certain disregard for you know health and safety or uh, air terminal rules, or is there something else that you can put your finger on that you know that um, that keeps that place so special in your heart? As it oh were? well, I mean it, it it suffered horribly, of course, from uh, tourism, but it's still a wonderful place, uh, and you can still get to fairly untrodden paths if you're just prepared to sort of go 10 miles up the road. Um, and I, I mean, if you were talking about Indonesia, I, I would say, you know, it's uh, it's staggeringly beautiful as geography. Uh, the people are the, <laughs> the sweetest in the world uh, and great gigglers. I mean, the world's great gigglers. Um, and, and the food is great. So I mean, what's not to like? Why it's 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 even nicer than Weybridge. <laughs> you said that it's ruined by tourism. I always find for people that like traveling a lot, 
there's a sort of inherent contradiction in in that they they want to go and experience new places they just don't want anyone else to go there either do you oh, that's is, it Ab absolutely i mean anthropologists are the worst of all because uh, they're not tourists they are travelers um and they have a i mean one of the interesting things about anthropological photographs is that they sort of always look 20 years out of date because the anthropologists always keep the other white faces out of shot yeah um and yes that's uh, that's uh, that's a very bad habit uh, that people have because there is nothing more real on this earth than tourism so it's part of reality so have you resolved your own role in that in terms of well I've, I've actually had to be a bit more strict with myself than I used to be because when I wrote that first book, The Innocent Anthropologist, I mean, I put real place names and real people's names in it. I, I mean, out of sheer innocence, it didn't occur to me that anyone would buy a copy of the book and use it as a tourist guide and go there and, you know, harass people and make a nuisance of themselves. So I've had to learn now that you know you change the names and you change the places and even when you don't it usually comes back and bites you in the bum i mean i uh, i once wrote a book about something called Dwayne fubara calabari funerary screens from southern nigeria basically uh, in the 19th century the calabari saw european uh, photographs and portraits for the first time and they started carving them so it's a nice idea, a nice, you know, them looking at us, as it were, mm -hmm. as opposed to us looking at them. So they're, they're still there in the men's meeting houses. And I, I thought, uh, you know, one of the useful things to do would be to write a catalogue of these and thus protect them from, uh, you know, being sold off in the art market and people know where they were and they would be able to go and see them, generate a bit of income for people and so on and so on. So I did that. And subsequently, I discovered the book was being used as a handbook by robbers who were going around stealing these things. And so I, you have to be so careful these days. That's crazy, isn't it? Nigel Barley's ha uh, hand guide to uh, ro robbing. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Come and nick this. Facts, indeed. OK, so we're just going to stay in Indonesia, I think, for your third wonder of the world, which is your memory. And this is about a particular journey that you took whilst you were there. Well, the thing about memory is, of course, you to remember something, you have to forget 90% of it. Right. Um, now, I'm, I'm told that I've conflated two separate memories here, but this is my memory and it's a nice memory, so I'm going to hang on to it. Who, who, so before you, go, before you go on, who's who's trying to bring this wonderful memory oh, down? Someone who happened to uh, be with me at the time. Oh, outrageous behaviour. <laughs> <laughs> How dare they? Anyway, but, so you tell us your version of it, Nigel. They're, right, not, here, well, they're not here to interrupt. <laughs> It was uh, in, in one of the outer islands, Sulawesi, um, and I was trying to set up a, an exhibition there's a, a, for the British Museum. Um, now, th there's a lot of hoo-ha about museums these days and the stuff that's in them and sending it back and all that. Um, I, what I was trying to do at that time was not sort of go to a place, buy up the nice stuff, put it in a box and take it away. What I was trying to do was to encourage a traditional skill and the Tarajans build these beautiful carved, painted, decorated uh, houses, some of which are hundreds of years old, and they have great curved roofs. They, they look like great birds sitting in the landscape. And I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if I could bring back some house carvers, a container full of raw materials, and they could build it in the middle of London. And that would be the exhibition. Uh, and they'd make, you know, the people doing the work would get the money, it would be a tr encouraging a traditional skill, data, but you can imagine. Yeah. Um, so the idea was that I, I would bring over four carvers, three different generations from the same family. Um, and of course, I don't know how I had this idea. It's crazy. You can imagine the administration, the paperwork, the difficulties, the rules, the regulations. There's a bit in the book I, where you tell a brilliant story about one of the guys trying to, I think it's some sort of, uh, I guess it's carving equipment that could easily be mistaken for some fairly serious weaponry, trying to sort of wander onto the plane carefree with this with this selection of knives and... Uh, oh yes, swords. knives and, and spears and goodness knows what. I mean, nowadays we'd all end up in jail, I'm sure. Uh, nowadays I wouldn't even try it, but yes. this was the optimism of youth, and as I say, young people know they're immortal. Indeed. So there we were. One of the, the, the important steps was getting the Bupati, the local government representative of the central government to sign a load of pieces of paper so that I could get these people who had no official existence, passports and exit permits to leave Indonesia. 
Um, so, in the, I mean, nowadays, if you want to go to Tarajalan, you get on a jet in that fancy, new fancy airport in Jakarta. In those days, you went on a rusty old steamer for a couple of days, and then you got on a horse. Uh, and I was spoiled because the people I was staying with had a, a pickup truck. Oh, they said, well, well, we'll give you a lift to the Bupati's house, which is, you know, a couple of miles out on a hill. Um, so I, I went outside thinking I was going to sit next to the driver. Not so. They put this huge chintz covered armchair on the back of this pickup truck. And I was required to sit in the armchair and be driven through the streets to the Bupati's house. And it was a lovely evening, a tropical evening, warm lightning, fireflies, the river by the road, absolutely lovely. And then we got to town. Well, unfortunately, it was the day when the Hajis, the, the pilgrims, come back from Mecca. Uh, and everyone had come out to greet them and get a bit of the blessing they were bringing back. And, you know, they were all standing there. Is that them? Oh, no, 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 that's not there. Is that them? No, 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 no. Well, ah, here they think. It wasn't the Hajis, it was me coming round the corner, sitting in this armchair on the back of a pickup truck, um, absurdly, you know, waving like the Queen at the, at the crowds, and they thought it was the funniest thing they'd ever seen in their lives. I, they screamed with laughter. Uh, and when Indonesians laughed, they laughed. They rolled on the ground, they wet themselves, they had a lovely time. Um, and then, of course, we unfortunately drew up at the only traffic light in the whole of Tehran. Why there's a traffic light, I don't know, because there's no traffic. And it was red. And it stayed red for God knows how long. And that intersection is the place where all the school kids meet, because they haven't got electricity at home, so they come out at night and they read their school books under the streetlights. And they looked at me and I looked at them and they just roared with laughter and they all rushed up all these school kids and they hugged me and they stroked me and they said the only English they knew, which was, yes, they said, yes. And it felt as if the, I mean, the whole of, you know, Indonesia were giving me this enormous great hug. Uh, and I, 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 I think I've possibly known that that feeling about once or twice in my entire life but it was a lovely moment it was sort of a moment where you could believe that the the world was a good place and it was full of love so I've hung on to that memory oh that's a beautiful memory so I guess you're fairly if you're a bit of a you know a lot of these places that you've been you're a bit of a curiosity to the to people and uh, um, a source of amusement or um, intrigue I'm guessing you're reasonably comfortable being the centre of attention to some extent, Nigel. Is that fair to say? Well, as long as you, I think, uh, you know, you should never believe your own publicity. Don't believe that you really are important or wonderful or Indeed, strange. Yeah, yeah, as long as you see the sort of comic side of it. Yeah, definitely. And um, you said that you found that experience a couple of times where you felt like the world's been giving you a hug. Is that an Indonesian thing that you think that they have the ability to make people feel like that? Well, I... If I can risk a link here, that sort of takes us to our, our record um, revolver. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> because, um, well, when did that come out? Well, it was 1966, was it? wasn't it? 67, something like that. No, 66, I think you were right, yeah. All oh, right. Well, at that time, I was working as uh, an English assistant in a French school. Um, you know, I'd been, uh, what, 19 or something. Uh, it was terribly exciting and, you know, the world was all new and fresh and I was going off working, living in a foreign language for the first time. Um, and of course, I learned a great deal more French than the kids did English. But when that record came out, I was suddenly the coolest thing on two legs because I was English. Right. And I'm sure my, my, my pupils are terribly disappointed I didn't have a Liverpool accent and speak <laughs> English properly. Um, but briefly, uh, I, I did feel that, you know, that that real being the centre of attraction. Uh, and even if I didn't have a Liverpool accent, I had a flowery shirt, which was the next best thing in those days. <laughs> um, and that record was, was very important to me. I mean, it, it, it's impossible now, I think, to... Uh, to feel the excitement of that period in England when all those old barriers seem to be crashing down and young people seem to be actually taking over the world. And England, Britain, no, England, come on, let's be honest, England was, and London specifically, was the sort of cultural capital of the, the universe at that mm -hmm. time. 
Uh, and when that record came out, I was, of course, immensely captivated by it. You know, there are all sorts of things in there that are revolutionary. The Beatles were really the first people to reinvent the LP. You know, before that, you had a couple of decent songs in it, and you basically filled it up with old rubbish, mm -hmm. uh, re-recordings of old stuff. I mean, they didn't do that. Every LP was stacked with new tracks, things you've never heard before, brand new songs, fresh songs, and of course, songs of a kind and a quality that you didn't get on LPs before. And, you know, all the things are there. There's, there's George with his sitar, and there's, there are some heavy rock numbers, and there are some lyric numbers. Um, yeah, when you talk about the influences in George and his sitar, it's actually amazing. Um, I was really surprised because I listened back as to prepare, prepare for this. I listened back to the Beatles albums in order. And whilst there's a lot of material between their early stuff and Revolver and the like, Actually, time-wise, it it's a quite a short time span. They make a big journey, don't they, musically? It's quite It's incredible. I mean, the, the 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 creativity that was everywhere in music at that time was quite extraordinary. Mm. Um, I mean, every you know, every week there would be some new wonderful thing coming out, um, and young people. I mean, that was the soundtrack to young people's lives. Yeah. And they've the, the the children of the '60s obviously have left a very good legacy in terms of music and other iconic moments. How do you feel you've performed uh, more generally, as in terms of uh, you know, I don't know politics or some other sort of other things that you might like to have achieved when you were all? Um, I think you were you would have been in your late teens, early twenties around this time, wouldn't you? How do you think you've yeah. done as a, as a generation on that front? <laughs> I think you could, if you wanted to be kind, you might call it an age of innocence. Um, really kicking the can down the road for the next generation to have to pick up. Um, yeah, I, I, we had a lot of fun, I would say. Um, and uh, we didn't know the harm we were doing. We didn't realise we were wrecking the world uh, and uh, leaving a huge burden of, of debt and pollution and all these other social and cultural problems behind for other people to, to, to pick up the tab for. Yeah. So, yes, I mean... Uh, uh, it was a wonderful uh, golden age, and of course, it was uh, it was built on uh, all the grief that had to follow. Indeed, yeah, I think you know most most music fans, for example, would 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 consider some of the music from the sixties to be uh, you know a bit special in a way that maybe a, other decades, I think, would would struggle to match. Um, well, got... many years later, I, uh, I I had to, I had a friend who was doing some recording in Abbey Road Studio. Wow. And I managed to actually get in, and it did. It did have that feeling of, you know, you were visiting a holy shrine. Indeed, yeah. But I, I wouldn't want to to pretend that it was all, you know, hello sunshine. Um, uh, that record for me has got also a downside. Uh, okay. I, in fact, I'm aware that I've actually avoided listening to it for for, for many years, and that's because um, I was a. It was being played, like, especially Helena Rigby was being played a lot. Uh, I think it was the most popular record of its year when I was a first year undergraduate. And that was my first experience of unrequited love. Right. And I have this memory of being uh, walking across the bridge at St. John's in Cambridge. And it was one of those cold winter nights you get in Cambridge with the, the, the fog blowing in from the fens and an icy wind. And here I was, my little heart gripped in unrequited love. And I heard an a cappella version of Eleanor Rigby being sung by this beautiful choir in the chapel. And I don't think I've ever felt <laughs> so depressed in my life. It sounds like something from a very gleamy British <laughs> film that does. <laughs> uh, I feel, I don't want to pry, but I feel like I need to ask whether this love, uh, did it stay unacquainted or... Well, it was actually, it's sort of interesting. It stayed unrequited, and it was that that drove me off to do my field work in Africa really? in my beau geste moment. Uh, okay, there we go. Um, I, I also need to say thank you for this because I, um, I, I hadn't listened to Evolve for a long time. And um, I've got a, a, a young child, well, a baby at the moment, she's six months old. Um, and so I'm only sleeping has become a bit of an anthem in my house because <laughs> it, re <laughs> it resonates very well with me at the moment. And, it, yes. and, it, and not only because for the for the for the meaning of the song, but actually I just think it's a, a, such an unappreciated song. I just you know it doesn't doesn't get mentioned amongst the Beatles. Sort of um, you know not when you hear it talked about very often. But yeah, no, that's true. That's I'd, true. Uh, definitely. Oh, it's full of again. gems. Absolutely yeah, full indeed, of gems. Indeed. Okay, so let's um, let's go from your 
album, which I which I got along very well with, to your film, which um, uh -huh. uh, I think I feel like you possibly you possibly selected this just to sort of point out to me how uh, how uncultured I am or how narrow minded I am. Your film. I is, have no uh, other mission in life. <laughs> your film is uh, the 1996 Peter Greenway film, uh, The Pillow Book. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they, I, I, I'm almost speechless, uh, Nigel. So you, you tell us about the film and why, why you love it so much. Right. Um, well, I have to say Greenway has made some some real stinker films, but not this one. This one I absolutely adore. Now, it, it's got no car chases in it. It doesn't have any shark attacks. No. Um, it's not that sort of film. It's uh, as close, I think, as a film will ever get to poetry. It's, I mean, even you surely would admit it's a very beautiful film. Yeah, it's definitely. I think. Um, I think. I whilst I I maybe failed to appreciate its artistic qualities, I can see that I can see that somebody with a more sophisticated taste than I I have got some stuck up pots you mean. Would, would be able to do that. No, it's got it's, got, it's very artistic, isn't it? To be honest, at first when I was watching it, at first I thought that I maybe um, was watching a, a bizarre version of it because they, there's so much going on, on the screen, isn't there? So the film. It's not. It plays around with all sorts of filming techniques, all sorts split of screens, indeed, overlapping, yeah. overlapping side yeah. Tra uh, soundtracks. Yeah. Uh, well, that's one of the things I like about it that it's not a filmed version of something else. It's conceived as a film, it's executed as a film, and it's completely uncompromising as a film. I, I mean, I suppose I, I should say it's it, it's a, it, it's a love story. It's it's almost a sort of Romeo and Juliet. Say, oh God, unrequited love again. Um, <laughs> uh, and it, it's about a, a girl who grows up with this strange obsession, this sexual obsession with having writing on her body, and it sort of explores the analogies between the human body and books, and the way that books live and people live, and so on and so on. So I also I need to make a confession there as well because I. I suspect that possibly one of the reasons I struggled with it was my slightly British prudishness found the idea of it involving nudity and eroticism, but not being, you know. You get a, enough of that at home. <laughs> it put me, I, 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 as, as a British person, it was it was like, this isn't a pornographic film, is it? I just, I just been asking me to watch because it's got some naked people in it. That and uh, yeah, that's my again, that's my own shortcoming. But yeah, sorry. You, you see, you under the clothes, everyone is naked. Uh, that, that was one of the weird things about my first field work. Um, I mean, people do did walk about almost uh, start naked, especially women. Women went bare breasted with just a bunch of leaves fore and aft. And after a fortnight, you don't notice. Really, you really do not notice. Uh, it's the least important of things. We're, we're definitely tangent in now, but um, so did you? Did you, as it were, go native in that sense, or did you keep a, a sort of a certain level of clothing that well, you felt required? Well, now um, the, the whole centre of Dwyer life is male circumcision, right. which they practice very enthusiastically. I mean, basically, they peel the penis for its entire length. And it's a horrible operation. And it's absolutely crucial for any man to undergo this operation because it's the difference between being a man and being a boy. Um, now, some anthropologists would say I ducked out. I paid six bottles of beer to be reclassified as honorary circumcised. Yeah, given the description you just gave me, Nigel, I think, <laughs> I think I'm going to forgive that. And I'd say that's the best six bottles of beer you've probably ever uh, my, spent. My, my penis sheath, which I had to wear. Um, on formal occasions, um, is part of the British Museum collection really? and part of the, the the accumulated cultural wealth of our nation. That, um, that's nice um, and if you if you go there, you can ask to see it. Brilliant. So, do, do you like uh, any films that are not um, exotic or, or you know? Um, oh, so good lord! Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, uh, Bruce Willis. Good. I, I enjoy quality trash. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean, good uh, Clint Eastwood, I mentioned earlier. Great films, great films. Dirty Harry, yes, wonderful. That's reassuring to know. Okay, so from your film to your book, um, and again, I'm, I see I, I, I'm torn here, Nigel, because I feel like well, I've got two things I need to do. I need to be relentlessly positive on this mm -hmm. uh, show, whilst also being honest. <laughs> and and I, I'm going to struggle to do both of those things now. So Earthly Powers was your book, and it's the 1980 novel by Anthony Burgess. It is, it's, a dense, it's a dense undertaking in my experience, Nigel. Well, it's a huge... I, yeah, I feel guilty about making you read that huge book, but there we go. Um, yeah, um, Burgess is best known, of course, for A Clockwork Orange. Um, and I always have this view that writers are probably best known for their worst books. Right. Um, 
Is um, that the case with I, you then, quickly? Yeah, probably. Okay. Probably. Interesting. Sorry, carry on. <laughs> but innocent anthropologists will go on my gravestone. Um, I, I, I always thought that was actually a metaphor, but a few months back, I actually went to had to go to a funeral in Oxford, and some ghastly old don had actually put his list of publications on really? his tombstone. That's incredible. <laughs> anyway, sorry, earthly powers. Yeah, it's um, the thing about Burgess is that he doesn't just write beautiful scenes. He writes beautiful sentences. Do you remember the opening sentence? Of, uh, I, I can't remember powers? off the top of my head, but I, I do remember, you know, yeah, that definitely <laughs> got, got my attention. Have you got, got it there? Me, got me a copy here uh, somewhere. Yes, here we go. <clears throat> It was the afternoon of my 81st birthday, and I was in bed with my catamite when Ali announced that the Archbishop had come to see me. Now that sort of leaves so many dangling threads that you have to go on to the next sentence. He writes beautiful sentences. Um, uh, and it, it's, it, again, you see, it, it's a book that deals with very, very deep themes, you know, the goodness of God, salvation, evil, political power, war, death, damnation, and it's very, very funny. At least I find it very, very funny. I mean, he, he, does, a, he, he does somehow find a route through all these things um, which show the absurdity of life and take enjoyment from the absurdity of life, and I find that very sympathetic. When you read it, did you, did you feel like um, you... you... So I felt like I wasn't getting everything. Like uh, there was a lot going on. A bit like if you're in a, in a room with people and they're making sort of smart in jokes that you're, you're, <laughs> that they're, that they're, you know, passing you by. And I think that that riled me a little bit. Did you? I, did you? Have yeah, a... I sympathise with that. He he does do that. He uh, he can't just you know if he if he he's got a nice little fact that not a lot of people know that. Uh, he sort of wants to put it up there in the text. Yeah, uh, it's almost as if it should come with footnotes. You know. Yeah. Yeah, th th he does do a little bit of that, but I, I I'm 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 willing to forgive him any of that uh, for the sheer amount of uh, laughter that that, that 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 he's given me in that book. And one of the satisfactions of having a bad memory is that you can reread the same book for the first time again and again and again and i've written it you know, so many times and got so much more out of it each time that's nice have you um as, a, as, as somebody who's a writer yourself does that change the way that you read and are you able to to read books um and, and switch off that part of your brain and just enjoy them for reading's sake or or do you think that the fact that you're a writer always means that you read books differently or always looking for things that you you know that might influence you or you know admiring admiring the way someone's done something does that make sense the question yeah i i i never actually call myself a writer i think a writer is rather a grand thing i would never put that in my passport i always regard myself as someone who occasionally writes a book yeah. um yeah uh well you see as a, as a hack academic for so many years and someone who had responsibilities for the library at the museum um every month I would get a great stack of anthropology books on my desk uh, which I had to plow through and you know you would the, the the challenge was to get through it find the central idea discover what was wrong with it onto the next book right. and you gutted books you didn't read them you gutted them and you didn't even see the words and suddenly I found that when I retired all that disappeared and I had to relearn how to read books actually seeing the words not just going straight through yeah. them and sort of ripping the guts out of them um so that's something i've had to learn um and i i i do sort of feel that that, that it was burgess who taught me how to write sentences of real words um and so i'll, I'll always be grateful to him for that but i mean you are you are quite right um uh, you do tend to look at books in a different way. You you find yourself thinking, ah ha ha, you didn't know how to finish that scene, or oh dear, he's right. fudged a bit there. Yeah. Uh, or um, more often, of course, what a wonderful start to a book, but he didn't know how to end it. I've called everyone he, and I'll get now I get in trouble. <laughs> books are mainly written by women these days. They put in on put in they for he. Nice recovery. Um, so my other excuse for um, making such a meal of earthly powers is that I started reading 
one of your own books at the same time, which in my experience is always a, a mistake. I always end up loving one book and resenting oh, the other one. You didn't find the bits I stole, did you? <laughs> no, well, I, so I, it's interesting that you say that he, you think he influenced your style because I, I, I read um, your book even at the same time, which is a, a sort of, oh, it's a, it's a fictional look at the concept of revenge. Is that fair to say? Yeah, um, I, I guess that's true. Um, I mean, if you wanted, if you wanted to put it in an anthropological framework, you'd say the ascription of misfortune. <laughs> Superbly done. Um, and I actually found the thing that the reason that I enjoyed your book so much more than than his was because you're writing. This might sound a bit ridiculous, but your your writing was so much more readable. It's it's it was direct and it didn't feel like effort at all. That's that's what I like about all your books. I think they're, they're quite an effortless read. I don't know one whether you, how you feel about that observation, but also how do you feel about um, when somebody says, "Oh, actually, I preferred your book to you know a book that you hold in such high regard." How do you how are you at taking that sort of uh, compliment? It, it's not a problem I've often had to deal with. <laughs> Um, no, I, uh, it, it's interesting you say that because I've, I've recently had a sort of the opposite problem. Um, I've been writing about Oscar Wilde. Now, when Oscar Wilde got out of prison, he changed his name. He became Sebastian Melmoth. Right. And I, it occurred to me, what would Sebastian Melmoth have made of Oscar Wilde? And so I found myself writing in the voice of Sebastian Melmoth. And you're, you're writing in a 19th century voice of someone who was very, very aware of his own word power and his own status as a wordsmith and so forth. Um, and Wilde's own prose these days is unreadable because it's so constipated and it's so self-aware. And I found it really hard to sort of find a way of writing that signified that without actually reproducing it. So I mean, um, your, your your statement about finding my, my my prose straightforward and uncomplicated has been something of a problem for me oh, in I this recent book. Yeah, yeah, I felt like you completely dodged my compliment there, Nigel. But I, I get the point you're making. <laughs> so okay, on to your last um, choice for Wonder of the World. And the more I thought about this, the more I'm a bit bemused by this. Um, so I feel like you'll need to you'll need to explain explain this to me. So see if I can understand it. So the person you, that you've chosen is Stamford Raffles, not yeah. a name that will be familiar to um, to most people. So I suppose we need to start off with a little bit about who he is and um, you know what 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 you, what you what he got up to. Um, yeah. Several hundred years um, ago. Well, Thomas Stamford Raffles. Yes. Uh, not terribly well known. Anyone who does know him in the UK, I think would know him as the man who invented Singapore, um, which he did in 1819. Uh, he was, what, what did you say, 1781 to 1826. He died at the age of 45, on his, I think either the day before or the day after his 45th birthday. So he didn't live very long. Um, I first came across him at the British Museum where I looked after his collection. He made a collection uh, between 1811 and 1816 in Java. I, uh, gosh, there's so many subordinate clauses coming here. What, what, what happened was the Napoleonic Wars were going on. The uh, French had occupied Holland. Holland had occupied Java. And the Brits were terrified that the French were going to use it as a base for operations against the British Navy. Uh, so Stamford Raffles, was given an army from the East India Company, an Indian army basically, and told to go to Java, destroy the fortifications and withdraw. He had no intention of doing that. He thought Java was such a wonderful place that he wanted to grab it for the British Empire. Um, and although he was supposed to be a military commander, he was working for a private company, he was supposed to make money, as they say, it was the ultimate Tory dream, you know, run an empire as a business and squeeze every penny out of it. Yeah. Um, he actually behaved as if he'd been sent by the British Council. Uh, and he fell hopelessly in love with Java. He thought it was one of the great civilizations of the world and should be recognized as such. He turned his administrators into cultural and linguistic researchers. He gathered all this information together. He wrote a huge book called The History of Java, uh, and he got fired because he didn't make any money. Um, he then um, 
having learned that the secret of life was to disobey orders, uh, he was dumped by the company in this rundown British colony of Bunkulu in Sumatra, where he started again. He, he, he started turning the prisoners from the jail into settlers. He started building schools. <laughs> he started spending money. Uh, and of course, he was unforgiven by the company for this. He founded Singapore against orders of the company. And Singapore was one of those parts of the empire that wasn't grabbed. It was actually built. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and people have worked very hard to turn Raffles into a colonial villain uh, and his collection into one of those awful looted things that, you know, museums shouldn't have. I think museums have allowed themselves to be totally wrong-footed here, seen as, you know, the trophy cabinet of empire, as opposed to some sort of international space where intercultural understandings happen and dialogues happen and, mm -hmm. you know, fruitful conversations ensue and objects and people talk to each other. Um, so he did make this huge collection, which he sent back um, uh, and ended up after his death at the British Museum, who didn't want to pay 10 shillings to uh, have someone go and see whether it was worth having. Um, and uh, in many, his, I suppose his memorial is not here, it's in Singapore, where he founded this uh, college called, uh, it was called the Singapore Institute, it's now the Raffles Institution. Um, and it was really a college where young men, because we were talking about men at that time, would go and learn the value of their own culture. I mean, not be brainwashed into British culture, not learn the names of the railway stations on the Northern Line, like the, you know, Dutch citizen, Dutch colonial uh, citizens were obliged to do. Um, and it's still there to this day. Um, uh, and in fact, I mean, the people who run Singapore are now Raffles Institution boys. Uh, so he had a lasting effect. He, he himself was from a poor family. He struggled hard for an education and <laughs> I, I, I compared him to the British Council. He thought that education would save the world. Right. Um, uh, and I mean, he, he, was, he was one of the good guys of empire and there weren't many of those, for goodness sake. So there's a couple of things that I've picked out there. First of all, would it be fair to say that um, He's got a slightly rebellious and adventurous streak, which are things that you have in common with him. Is that fair? Oh, well, I think that's a uh, tremendous flattery. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't claim I had any features in common with Stanford Raffles. Just in, um, terms of, but, in terms of why he appeals to you as a character, I suppose, is uh, you know, that's part of the... Uh, the yeah, uh, I, basically, as, as I say, I, he appeals because he was a good guy and uh, he was interested in it. He had enormous respect for the, uh, the people around him. I mean, he believed in civilization, but he didn't think that civilization had to have a white face. I think that's, and so that's the other thing that's really interesting about, about him as a person, is that um, it, feels, it feels to people who aren't very engaged um, in a lot of the debates that you've touched on there in terms of, you know, museum collections, statues, those sorts of things that are, you know, being discussed a lot. For people who aren't sort of, heavily invested in those debates um it feels like to some extent you're talking about whether you should judge historical figures by the context of their time in which case you're going to need to know a lot about the context to, to to reach an informed opinion or whether you should view them you know just in the sort of cold light of day from from 2021 and look at them and say what they did was wrong or you know what they did was right have you I take it from what you've talked about him that you you think that it's 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 possible and it's right that we look at somebody like him and say we have to judge him by the standards of his day and on, by that standards he was a very good guy who who we can say is admirable. Is that fair? Well, I think that that's absolutely true. But something else follows on from that, which is that the judgments that we are making today are not set in rock for all time. They are historically. No. Uh, contextualized judgments too. In 50 years time, people are going to be disagreeing with uh, the views that we have now, the judgments we make. Mm -hmm. So I think a, a little a little humility needs to be uh, injected into these uh, strident moral attitudes that people adopt. Yeah, I mean, I always think, uh, I, I cannot wait to hear what my grandchildren are going to say to me about the fact that I used to drive a car to, to the shops when it was only you know, five <laughs> minutes away. I'm sure they're going to have some choice words about that. Um, so, 
uh, that that is your that is your seventh one of the world today. You're sticking in that sort of um, area professionally, I, I believe. You you continuing to do historical fiction now is, is what you do mainly, isn't it, Nigel? Um, more or less. Um, I, mean, I, I still have that weird bee in my bonnet about, uh, you know, why do anthropologists write about cultures they know nothing about? Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 I still have that thing that I would... I mean, I, I wrote a book um, a while back called Coronation Chicken, which is about the social and cultural world that I grew up in yes, as great. a kid in the 1950s. Um, and it was an attempt to, I mean, using the amount of time and experience that lies between then and now to try to get an outsider's view of what it was all about. Um, so I, I, I still feel, you know, I've got something to do in that area and I've got some way to go in that sphere. What, in terms of maybe going going back and writing a bit more about, about your own life and... and yeah, the and maybe spent? moving it a bit forward and, uh, you know, um, perhaps writing more about current cultural concerns. I mean, we talked about this business of uh, museums and uh, making moral judgments. So there, there, there's still something I need to do about that, I think. I, I, I tell you, my, myself, I think, again, I... I find I find a lot of those debates, um, for want of a better word, tiring. And one of the reasons is because it feels to me like people on both sides are are taking it far too seriously and far too dogmatic. So I think uh, it would benefit from your lighter touch. So I'd, I would definitely look forward to reading anything you had to say about the subject, Nigel. Well, I think uh, you know humour is one of the most important tools of anthropology. You 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 go into the field and you you. You, you, you struggle all day desperately to build little fragile bridges of understanding between us and them and so forth and so forth. And then the high priest comes out of the temple at the high point of the ceremony, slips in the mud and falls flat on his face and everybody laughs. And it's at that moment of laughter that you realize that you actually you're all understanding each other. And that's the only moment when you're absolutely certain of that. Brilliant. Well, that was a wonderfully profound ending for our chat today, Nigel. Thank you ever so much for joining us on One of the World. And we, uh, I look forward to reading whatever you've got coming out in the future. For anybody listening, I would recommend, uh, yeah, I think if they want to try out your fictional works, I would go for even. And for your anthropological works, I, I would just read them in chronological order, starting with the innocent anthropolo anthropologist. Is there any <laughs> anything that you were any uh, any ones in particular that you would you would like people to start with, Nigel? If anyone's going to pick some, no, back? I think I think that's uh, that's fair enough. Um, uh, I'm also well. There are, there are two other books I'm very fond of. One is the a book I wrote on African pottery called Smashing Pots. Um, and uh, its subtitle is Feats of Clay from Africa. And I'm proud of it largely because of the title. I didn't ever think I'd get a publisher to agree. I thought it would come out as a prolegomenon to a consideration of certain aspects of African terracotta or something. Right. But no smashing pots it was. Good. Uh, Good. And the other one, I, I suppose, is Island of Demons, which uh, is about uh, a community of artists in Bali in the 1920s and, and until the Second World War. Um, because I, I, I mean, I've actually met uh, the children and grandchildren of those those people I, I wrote about. Wow, wow. Well, that's uh, that's definitely two for me to look, look out for as well. Thanks for joining us today, Nigel, and I wish you all the best. Thanks, an absolute pleasure. To find out more about today's guest or the Wonders of the World podcast, then you can check out our website or get involved in all the usual social media nonsense. Wonders of the World is a borderline niche production, and we would just like to say thank you for listening. <laughs>